This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I right. Right. And I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. Two really great shows are coming up. We'll be at the Philadelphia Science Festival May 1st, and at the New York Hall of Science April 29th. More info at storycollider.org. This week's story is from Jack L. High, as part of our show, The Dark Side. The story was recorded in December 2013 at Littlefield in Brooklyn. Somehow, and I don't quite understand how, I have become a biographer of renegade scientists and physicians. And when I start on a project, one of those projects, this is how it works. I often start looking at papers, manuscripts. And they're manuscripts like um, the collected papers of the doctor who advocated and developed lobotomy as a treatment for psychiatric illnesses. Or sometimes I look at photographs, studying them for clues into this person's life and insights. Photos uh, like, for instance, um, images that I've seen taken of autopsies at, at state mental hospitals. And then I often rely a lot, too, on interviews Uh, people who knew my subject, spouses, friends, enemies, children. And uh, an example of that would be uh, people I've interviewed who suffered, went through sterilization procedures in state hospitals. This is fun. Um, I have to admit that. And uh, and, And I have... Uh, long regarded this as a kind of game, a pursuit, a challenge, a race sometimes, and it has been very invigorating for me to do this kind of work. A few years ago, I was at the beginning of one of these kinds of projects, and it was a project that I had uh, learned a little bit about, just a smidgen about, through some other unrelated research that I had done, and it was about a U.S. Army psychiatrist named Douglas Kelly, who had spent time with the top Nazi leaders being held for trial for war crimes and crimes against humanity at Nuremberg. And Dr. Kelly did spend extensive time with these men. And the, the other thing that I knew at the time, early on, was that all of this had ended in tragedy for Dr. Kelly and for others. And it was in pursuit of this particular project that one day I traveled from, uh, from my hometown, Minneapolis, to uh, a, a, a town in Northern California, Fairfield, California, to stand on the doorstep of this Dr. Kelly's son. I had earlier written to him, I tracked him down. Um, you don't know how many Kellys there are in this country. But I had tracked him down and um, asked him if he had any of his father's papers or belongings. He said he did. He invited me to come over. And that's how I landed on his doorstep. I was expecting to find, I was expecting the son to hand me maybe a couple of file folders or a family photo album, something like that. But the son welcomed me in to his house and pointed to a huge pile of boxes on the floor in his living room. And he said... Here they are, have at it. And he said, and by the way, there's more in the basement. And I saw this, this um, large number of boxes. It, it eventually turned out that there were about 15 
banker's boxes full of stuff. And I remember getting um, a feeling of nausea inside. There was so much. I thought it would take me weeks to go through this. It, and in fact, it took me years to go through it. But uh, the son left me alone and uh, left me in the living room with these boxes. So I picked up the top one and dragged it over near the sofa and started uh, to um, lift the lid and then looked around and saw this array of insolently lounging house cats staring at me, about six of them. So I took that in and went back to my box, opened the lid, and I was hit by an invisible cloud of decades-old tobacco smoke that had been spending a lot of time inside these boxes. Once my eyes stopped watering, I took a look at the top item in this box that I had opened up, and it was a large coat, old Kodak envelope labeled X-rays of Hitler's skull. Wow. So that got my attention, and <laughs> I opened it up. And inside there was indeed a set of eight x-rays uh, showing a skull on top of a spinal column with the outline of a, uh, of a head, a face. And it was Hitler's head and face. And these images were all that were left of the treatment that Adolf Hitler had received in 1944 for a sinus infection. And somehow, my Dr. Kelly had gotten a hold of these images while he was in Nuremberg meeting with the likes of Hermann Goering and Rudolf Hess and all the other top leaders on trial. I put the x-rays aside, and the next item uh, that I found underneath was actually a pair of items. First, a, a photographic portrait of, of Hermann Goering, who uh, was at one time, for a long time, Hitler's designated successor as Fuhrer. And it showed uh, Goering in full military regalia with storm clouds brewing behind him, looking very fierce. Goering had signed it and had written a dedication to Dr. Kelly on the photo. And then accompanying that photo, there is a vial of pills, which I eventually found out was part of the hoard of a narcotic called pericodine that Goering had, Britain, uh, had brought with him to Nuremberg uh, when he was arrested by the Allied forces. He was addicted to paracodine, and Dr. Kelly, one of the things Dr. Kelly did was help cure him of that addiction. So here I was holding a vial with a 65-year-old drug stash inside. And then finally underneath that Goering stuff, I found some envelopes, white envelopes sealed with black wax and uh, written in a shaky hand on, in German, on those envelopes were w names of foodstuffs like sugar and cookies and crackers. And as it turned out, these were samples of food that, uh, r that Rudolf Hess, deputy Fuhrer, um, one of the defendants, had refused to eat while he was in captivity because he believed that his jailers were trying to poison him. So as I went from the x-rays to the photo and the drugs to the poisoned food, um, my reaction was evolving from you know, being impressed to being astonished to being amazed and also feeling um, uh, like it was, uh, things seemed unreal. Um, what was I doing looking at this stuff in somebody's living room? It belonged in an archive or a museum somewhere. It did not belong in a living room uh, with a big picture window in it. And as I looked out, I could see a guy mowing his lawn across the street and kids walking to the nearby park. So I went on uh, and looked through the other boxes. And they included not just these weird artifacts, but also a, a lot of papers of various kinds. Um, uh, autobiographies that Dr. Kelly had asked each of the top Nazis to write of themselves in their own hand, some in German, some in English. Uh, he had tested all of them using the Rorschach inkblot assessment, so all those tests and scores there in, were in there, lots of other stuff. And as time went on, um, well, I first realized that this is stuff that no historian 
of the Third Reich, or scholar of the Nuremberg trials or the Holocaust has ever seen. And then I, um, as I continued to look at the materials, I began to tease out a little bit of the story that these, these papers and artifacts were telling, which was that Dr. Kelly had uh, spent a lot of time examining these men and testing them, and what he had learned was that medically and psychiatrically, they were normal. They did not suffer from psychiatric illnesses, personality disorders, nothing like that. And so you could infer from all that that these, these Nazi criminals were not monsters, and the crimes they committed came not from some kind of inhumanity, but from their humanity, their essential humanity. What could I do with all this? Well, I began writing, and I began working on the book, The Nazi and the Psychiatrist, that eventually developed out of all this material and this collection of papers and artifacts. It was the foundation um, for that book. And as I wrote the book, I saw, uh, it dawned on me uh, that there was a, a similarity between me and Dr. Kelly. Kelly was a psychiatrist. He examined people, interviewed them, um, tried to learn about them that way. I'm a biographer. I do the same thing. I interview people. I examine people. I poke at them. I, I circle around them and try and discover what their motivations are, impulses to diagnose them in a way. And um, it, was, uh, it was striking to me at the time especially when I remembered that um, overlaying, overlying this entire story, uh, the normality, normalcy of the uh, Nazis was a, a, a tragedy that happened on top of it, which was that uh, Hermann Goering, just as he was about, the day before he was about to be executed, had um, committed suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule that he had uh, kept hidden in his prison cell for months and months. And he had, com he had um, made this very dramatic gesture to the Allies, to the Americans who were holding him, saying, I'm going to leave on my own terms. Um, you're not going to tell me how I'm going to go, and I'm going to thumb my nose at you as I go. So I was working on this book, struggling with this nagging feeling that there was something similar to me and uh, between me and Dr. Kelly and the work that we did. This is probably a good time for me to tell you um, what that tragedy was that I mentioned earlier that came to Dr. Kelly as a result of his work in Nuremberg um, and with the Nazi leaders. And it was that he was greatly, um, uh, uh, I would say he was decimated by the realization that these men were normal and that, and that his specialty, his medical specialty, psychiatry, couldn't explain their behavior. And so Dr. Kelly kind of went off the rail and he switched his, his career focus from psychiatry to another um, discipline that he thought might explain things better, criminology. But also in his personal life, he went into kind of a downward spiral. He became a workaholic, an alcoholic. He had uh, a lot of uh, problems expressing his emotions. He got angry very easily, argued a lot with his wife, once fired a pistol at her in anger, missed and hit the floor. And um, also his children were afraid of him. When he came downstairs to, to spend time with them, say goodnight with them, to, to them, they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know which dad was going to come down and be with them. So um, that was uh, the culmination of all this tragedy in Dr. Kelly's life was that on New Year's Day in 1958, he took his own life in the same way that Hermann Goering had by swallowing cyanide in front of uh, his family, his entire family. So that's how Dr. Kelly's story ended. And part of my job in my book was to try and reconcile how did this happen. But I continued thinking about Kelly's career, my career. Uh, Dr. Kelly um, 
had looked into the eyes of Hermann Goering and uh, had seen himself in a lot of Goering's behavior and e egotism. I looked in Dr. Kelly's eyes and sensed a lot of myself in this um, urge to understand others, make sense of other people's lives, diagnose them. Um, but uh, what I learned from Kelly's experience was that this can be a very perilous, dangerous undertaking. And um, that in his case, he got close in many ways to the Nazi leaders, Goering in particular, and that had changed his trajectory, had pulled him down, I had dragged him to a bad place. And I wondered whether this was a possibility for me in my exploration of people who, um, who have deviated from the norm in their careers and in some cases you know, could be called evil. So since then, I have been very careful and um, when I write about somebody, I start considering how is this going to affect me and, and even my family by extension. So I have, uh, I'm no longer this game playing, um, happy go lucky, happy go lucky snoop that I used to be, and I approach things much more carefully now. Thank you very much. That was Jack L. High. Jack is the author of The Nazi and the Psychiatrist, as well as The Lobotomist, a maverick medical genius in his tragic quest to rid the world of mental illness. He has contributed articles and essays on science, medicine, and history to The Atlantic, Wired, Scientific American Mind, and many other magazines. Jack teaches nonfiction in the MFA program in creative writing at Osberg College and lives in Minneapolis. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love this podcast, please consider donating, storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, and to writers for leading us through the really dark places. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.